Well, thank you. It's, uh, it is good to be back at Yale. I seem to have been on a Yale track these last four or five years. Um, and it's always a great honor to have the opportunity to be with the uh, community up here. Um, this is actually my first time at the Divinity School, so it makes it especially sweet for me to be here. And Dean, Dean, thank you um, so much for, uh, uh, for your gracious introduction to the lecture and of uh, my participation. I should point out to you, just as a matter of, uh, of confession here, that those comments about the most influential rabbi in America and the quintessential religious lobbyist on Capitol Hill were actually interviews with my mother. Um, here, so uh, the uh, and I'm delighted and honored to see my uh, my good friend and uh, distinguished colleague Rabbi Herb Brockman, who's uh, here as well, who served the New Haven community <laughs> so magnificently for so many years. Um, in the ebb and flow of history, there come moments where we arrive at a crossroads. Future generations will be shaped by the decisions of the path we choose to follow. Sometimes the implication of those choices are made, that to be made are obvious for others. Only in hindsight do we see the implications of diverging roads with stunning clarity. In so many ways, we sense that today we are at such crossroads. The United States is at a crossroads facing the most fundamental decisions about the role of government in securing the economic and social well-being of its people in rebuffing those forces that threaten our religious tolerance, racial comedy, and our most fundamental commitment to equality without regard to religion, race, national origin, disability, gender, sexual orientation, or gender identity. As opposed to the open and, open and welcoming spirit of, for immigrants that has marked some eras of American history and which has meant so much to the rescue, safety, um, and flourishing of millions of oppressed across the uh, globe, including millions of Jews, we seem to be diverging onto a path leading back towards our most xenophobic eras. President Obama's refugee target of 110,000 uh, refugees for 2018 was cut to 45,000 by this administration with actual levels, as it turned out, much, much lower. And now in uh, plans to cut even further um, in 2019, all this in the face of the largest number of global refugees and displaced people in recorded history. We are facing a prospect of growing these severe disparities between the rich and the poor, arguably inherent in the capitalist system, that even the most developed economies and democratic uh, governments will be unable to achieve in equitable society. Sometime in the 17th and 18th century, the church adapted to evolving industrialization, capitalism. Today, blatant structural inequities in capitalism in nations rich and poor would seem to require religion to interrogate the moral impact of capitalism more assertively. We have not deviated from the path of rampant gun violence in America that so devastates our schools, increases the numbers of completed suicides, brings deadly violence into every corner of American life, our businesses, houses of worship, playgrounds, homes, that we can fashion only the most anemic solutions to our bloodiest problem remains one of the great moral travesties of our nation. We are witnessing the reshaping of our court system with appointment and confirmation of younger, more conservative judges who seem willing and determined to undo the Warren and Burger Court so expansion of civil rights, civil liberties, reproductive rights, as well as its affirmation of the strong separation of church and state, that together have given religious minorities unprecedented freedoms, including, again, my own community, the Jewish community, who has known more rights, more freedoms, more opportunities in America than we have ever known in our history. The world is at a crossroads in navigating varied clashes of civilizations, confronting the pervasive threat of terrorism, resolving the face of global poverty and global climate change, whether we are committed to making reasonable sacrifices to ensure that future generations will enjoy the fruits of God's creation. As the president ended his um, unresolved negotiations with, Northern and Korea, with North Korean leader Kim, and as Russia and China greatly expand their military arsenals, will we go down a path towards nuclear war or sensibly move away from it? 
Over two billion people in this world still live in abject poverty, making less than $3.10 a day. These are serious challenges that we face. Serious challenges that are exacerbated today by the growth and spread of authoritarian rulers across the globe who are cracking down on civil society, stifling human rights, dismantling the rule of law, eroding the most basic structures of democratic rule in their nations. On all these issues and so many more, the United States and the international community have vital, important decisions to be made as to where we will go. Look, I imagine every generation believes that the problems they face are more dangerous, more perilous than any generation before them. The only difference between their believing that and ours is that they were wrong and we are right. <laughs> and it is a state of technology that makes it different. This is a unique moment in history in which the consequences of bad decisions are simply more dangerous and perilous than humanity has known before. We've always known the ravages of warfare, the moral challenges of deciding when force can be justly used, when war is just, but never have we faced military technologies that if misused can destroy the world as we know it. We've always faced the threat of pollution to our water, air, and the concomitant responsibility to protect the creation God has entrusted to our stewardship and care, but not no match with the perils of a climate change that threatens to alter the entire climate of the globe. We've always experience intrusions into our privacy, repression of free speech, persecution of our religious lives, but not when matched with the technology that can make Orwell's nightmare of 1984 the reality of the world. We've always lived with the reality of economic injustice. Some of the Bible's most commonly repeated laws deal with protecting the poor, the stranger, the vulnerable, but never when globalization and technological disruptions to almost every sector of the economy portend both extraordinary opportunity or moral tragedy and societal destabilization on a global scale. We've always had the challenge of applying new technologies in an ethical and moral manner, but not when matched with artificial intelligence and genetic engineering that allow us to uh, create entire new forms of life and alter human life itself. In the next few years, we may indeed decide the path that humanity will follow in addressing these momentous issues and so many more. Will we use our wealth, our wisdom, our technology to help nations resolve their differences peacefully or destroy the world in a nuclear holocaust? To clean up the damage to our environment and protect it for generations yet unborn or to despoil and devastatingly contaminate it? To enhance those freedoms so essential to democracy and to allowing people to find spiritual fulfillment or to degrade and diminish them? to share God's wealth equitably and fairly with all God's children, or deny justice to the billions living in severe poverty and ignore the warning of the Talmud 2,000 years ago that the sword enters the world because of justice delayed or justice denied, to use genetic engineering to cure birth defects or to create Hitler's master race. The potential devastation of bad choices today suggests that we are living at the first moment in all of human history in which we can no longer to aff afford to make the errors we have made in the past and to learn from them. It's almost as though all of human history was a dry run for this moment. And this time, it counts. It is in such a spirit that I address the issues of being in the hands of God today. And I do so by focusing on the Jewish tradition to illustrate how our religious traditions might contribute to addressing these urgent challenges, but suggest a methodology for doing so that I think is equally common in every faith tradition that is represented, I'm sure, in this room and most of the global traditions, or for those who hold no religious belief at all. As I draw insights from Jewish law, moral values, and history, I must keep in mind that the Jewish tradition, and this is crucial, does not suggest that Jewish law, the Hebrew term is halakha, Jewish law answers how, a, how 
Jews to try to resolve social issues in a non-Jewish society. It doesn't mandate how we should do so. Let me explain. The binding character of Jewish law in traditional Judaism derives from the covenant in Mount Sinai between God and the Jewish people. Covenant, fancy name for a contract, can be binding only upon those who enter into it willingly or through an agent. As much as Dean Sterling and I might want to sign a contract with each other requiring that you draft all of our speeches for the next year, unless you enter into it willingly, we can't impose that on you. <laughs> The covenant at Sinai is binding only upon God and Jews. Non-Jews have not chosen to enter into the covenant of free of those obligations. Therefore, Jewish law is not intended, was never intended, to be imposed on non-Jewish societies. To answer the question of how non-Jewish societies should function. And this understanding is shared by Jews from all streams of Judaism. Of, of Judaism. While halakha is not intended to be binding on non-Jewish societies, the moral model of how the rabbis took halakha and applied it to a Jewish society and the fundamental moral values of the tradition may nonetheless offer invaluable insights that will speak across the centuries to decisions that America must make today. But how compelling that guidance may be is to be determined in the free marketplace of ideas of our nation within the logic of traditional Judaism. Jewish law is not applicable to non-Jewish nations, non-Jewish people. If that describes a limited role of halakha in shaping non-Jewish societies, at the same time, there are sources in each of our traditions that do convey universal principles. That is, they apply to all nations and all peoples, to those of our religion, of other religions, of no religion as well. In the Jewish tradition, these flow from numerous sources. I'm going to talk about a few of them in greater depth. But the extra-legal principles, assumptions, and values underlying the halakhic system, the Noahide covenant between God and all humanity, the universal message of the prophets, the lessons from Jewish history, um, the insights from Jewish and rabbinic interpretations of biblical texts, and from the moral writings of rabbis and Jewish philosophers over the ages. There are similar strands of universal values in almost every other religion um, as well. And I ask you simply to consider your ideas. Um, you have Roland Baton's life, his commitment to peace and justice, drawing on his own religious traditions, but going about it in America as an American is one example of that. These ideas are reflected in several essays in the recent book, um, Scripture and Social Justice, edited by uh, Dean Sterling, most particularly in the essay by your own Professor John Collins on biblical values. But to take a broader example, the Catholic bishops' pastoral letters on public policy, on social justice issues, including its pastoral letters on war and peace, dealing primarily with nuclear um, armaments, two letters a decade apart on economic justice for all, Letters on global climate change, on human trafficking, on the role of faith in politics, on a range of social policy issues. There is moral, civic, political power in these formal pastoral letters of the Catholic bishops over the past 35 years. They attracted enormous attention in Congress, in think tanks, in military study circles, at the White House. And the fact that they did is in part a reflection of the structure of the church in which the bishops speak with a unified authority that differs from the role of clergy in many other faiths, most particularly congregationalist religions such as Judaism. In part, it also is a reflection of the meticulous care that goes into writing and the preparation of those documents. Sometimes more than a year of examining an issue, meetings, formal hearings with a broad range of policy, science, military, and economic experts with many different viewpoints, delving deeply into the perspectives Catholic teachings offer on such issues. And finally, because of their emphasis on natural law values, they were easily accessible to non-Catholics as well as to Catholics. 
So let me focus on that for a moment. The most relevant component of those letters is the bishop's use of Catholic doctrine and how they apply its insights to the policy of a secular non-Catholic government. In Catholic thought, there are two primary sources of authority. One source is that which flows from Catholic sacred text and doctrine. This provided the first stage of analysis in each of the letter on each of these complicated issues. Often, the letter will suggest lessons learned over the centuries from how such doctrine was applied in communities controlled by the Catholic Church. The second source of authority flows from natural law. Those moral constructs that Catholicism believes are universal in nature, accessible to all through the use of reason, whether they are Catholic or not. In the letters, the moral insights from the examination of Catholic doctrine are then presented in terms of these broader universal moral principles, such as the common good, the duty to care for the poor and vulnerable, the use of military force only as a last resort, the obligation to care for creation, using examples from Catholic texts and Catholic history to illustrate the application of these universal moral constructs. The bishops do not believe that Catholic doctrine and dogma should be binding upon a non-Catholic society, that they should lobby Congress to introduce their doctrine, their dogma. They may advocate to, uh, to have Congress pass policy implementation of those ideas that they agree on, but that's no different than any other religious group who testifies before Congress on what insights their religion brings to bear. Rather, they provide an illustrative moral framework and ethical paradigm to consider in our nation's debate. Well, so too the application of Jewish values, law, and moral insights. I mentioned these key strands uh, in, a few minutes ago that are universal, and they parallel values embraced by many religious traditions. And they offer us a foundation for a multi-faith response to our current uh, challenges. So allow me to just go into a little more detail on several key ones. First, if the Jews at Sinai stood in agency for all the Jews yet to come, another covenant, the Noahide covenant, Noah stands in agency for all of humanity. Everyone is wiped out. His acceptance of the moral laws that the rabbis read into the story of Noah and the destruction of the world and the rebirth of the world described in Genesis, um, these are seen as binding on all humankind. The existence of certain fundamental moral laws, the seven Noahite laws the rabbis read into the stories, are therefore regarded as basic to any civilized society, including prohibitions against murder, robbery, blasphemy, idolatry, sexual crimes, eating the flesh of a, of a living animal, and most importantly for our discussion, the requirement that every community establish courts of justice. These were important universal values that apply to all. Secondly, from a number of the prophets came a universal vision, Jonah's lesson of God's concern for the morality of all nations, the well-being of all peoples. The universalist prophecy of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Micah, the God of the Hebrew Bible was seen by them as the God of all nations. O eternal, there is none like you. You are great, and your name is great in power. Who would not revere you, O ruler of the nations, asked Jeremiah. Isaiah asserts God's role in the world seen as being clear. Thus God will judge among the nations and arbitrate for many people. On this foundation of a universalist ethic and vision of the world, of God's dominion over all, emerges the biblical and post-biblical ethic of peace and justice for all nations of the world. Third, part of the Jewish tradition consists of the lessons of Jewish history. Jews who have been among the quintessential victims of group prejudice, discrimination, ethnic cleansing, have much to say about the need for justice and equality for others today. The lessons from our past from the Exodus through the Holocaust continue to warn, inspire, shape political dynamics in the world today. Each of you, in your own faith tradition, in your own faith community, can similarly offer rich lessons for all of us today. And finally, and perhaps most essentially for this discussion, are the extra legal, the outside the legal system, moral principles, assumptions, and values underlying that system 
in which we find a value system ordained by God to be applicable to all people, Jew and non-Jew alike. These values are perceived to inure in the very nature of humankind, the equivalent to our founding document, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Well, this idea goes back into ancient history. In these assumptions and principles are eternal. And Jews who would live up to the aspirations expressed in the Jewish tradition will insist that all human actions, societal and government policies, be measured by these principles. Many of them, in fact, have been absorbed through Christianity, Islam, the stra and strands of Age of Reason philosophy, which drew on Hebrew scripture into the mainstream of Western civilization and beyond. What are these values? You know them as well as I do, in fact. So I'm just going to list a few of them to help guide the conversation. First, the infinite value of every human being, rooted in the belief that we are all created in the divine image, that all of us have a spark of the divine within us. Second, the fundamental equality of all people, connected with the concept of the value and dignity of humanity, represented in the Midrashic stories, the stories of the early rabbinic interpretations of the Bible, that ask, why were we all descended from one couple? Why was Adam made from the dust of the four corners of the earth, so that none of us can claim that our ancestor is worthier than anyone else's ancestors? Descended from the same couple. We are all brothers and sisters. Third, the rule of law to which all citizens, even the highest human ruler, is held accountable. When Nathan confronts David, thou art the one. When Ahab is confronted by Elijah over Naboth's vineyard, we're taught even the highest human ruler is held accountable to the rule of law. Fourth, the requirement that every moral society should create courts of justice. That is, abide by the rule of law. Fifth, the protection of God's creation, affirmed by the assertion in the Psalms, the earth is the eternals and the fullness thereof. Six, distributive justice with care for the poor, the orphan, the widow, the hungry, the elderly, the ill, understood by many Jewish authorities as a moral obligation for all societies. Seventh, freedom of choice, perhaps Judaism's most significant contribution to Western thought. As Maimonides, the great Rambam, wrote, free will is granted to every person. The human species has become unique in the world in that it can know of itself what is good and what is evil, and in that it can do whatever it wishes. So did the Creator desire that each should be possessed of free will. For this reason is each person judged according to our own actions. Crucial to the analysis of applying the tradition is a recognition, as I said, that it is not the halakha, the law, that is binding upon a, the society, but it is these values, these universal values, that should measure um, uh, how we evaluate the policies in and laws of a non, and practices of a non-Jewish nation. Look, the bottom line is, that Judaism does not mandate for the nations of the world, for the nations of the world, whatever it did for a Jewish society, monarchies or democracies, socialism or capitalism. Nor does Judaism mandate food stamp programs, despite what some liberals believe, or supply side economics, despite what some conservatives believe. Judaism suggests to all Americans that our role as moral individuals is to test these human policies theories to see if they advance or impede those universal moral values. Do they enhance the dignity and equality of human beings? Do they bring us closer to a world of justice and peace? Good moral people can differ on these justice, on these judgments. Neither liberals nor conservatives have a lock on a definitive uh, authoritative approach to how those values resolve current policy challenges. One can argue that the only real political sin in Jewish thought is to do nothing in the face of evil and suffering. As John Collins observed in his essays, while the measures necessary for realizing justice may be open to debate, the urgency for the demand for justice is clear, the most central value of all. 
So let me apply those to some of the issues that we face today. First, foreign policy. The principles of dignity, equality, perfectibility, um, a responsibility for justice and peace, the rule of law, just distribution of God's wealth, the demand we use God the world's resources moderately and sustainably. These are the values that many religious traditions bring to bear on the foreign policy issues confronting us today. In the values of fundamental dignity and equality of humankind, we find the foundation for religion's extraordinary contribution in America and internationally to the concept of unalienable rights and for our responsibility to secure human rights for all God's children. Indeed, the framers of the fundamental documents of this nation, such as the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, as well as the framers of our modern international documents, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, often turn to the Hebrew Scriptures for their inspiration. Consider in this context what is arguably the Prophet's most eloquent call for international peace. From Micah 4, 1 to 5, expanding on the words of Isaiah, in the end of days it shall come to pass, and you all know this text, that the mountain of the Eternal's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills. People shall flow unto it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Eternal, to the house of the God of Jacob, so that God may teach us of God's ways, and we will walk in God's paths. For the law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Eternal from Jerusalem, and God shall judge among many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. They shall sit every, sit every person under his vine and under a fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the eternal has spoken it. For as all the peoples walk, every one in the name of her God, we will walk in the name of the eternal, our God, forever. Now, Robert Gordius, who is a great Jewish scholar, a mid-20th century scholar who's both life and professional career almost paralleled exactly Baton's. Um, they died within a very short time of each other at about the same age. Um, uh, he points out that the phrase, Acharita Yamim, in the end of days, is not in the Hebrew Bible, understood the way it is in other religious traditions. Repeatedly, the Bible uses a term to refer to goals that are within a relative near future or the foreseeable distant future. The conquest of Canaan described in Genesis or the anticipated early restoration of the kingdom of Ephraim and Hosea, what is distinctive in Micah's words is that there is no indication he envisioned the establishment of a new world order as a result of a great cataclysm or of a special divine intervention or of the creation of a supernatural um, order. It will happen as an outgrowth of history, not as an anti-history. In other words, the bringing of peace and justice is our responsibility, and the Bible reminds us ours to actually achieve. Second, it is a vision that calls for the creation of international law. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and God shall judge among many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off, Isaiah says. In other words, before peace can come, there must be a legal system accepted by all nations with mechanisms to enforce that law and a process to judge the disputes that will inevitably arise. It did not assume that in the process towards peace, nation states, wrongdoing, conflicts would all disappear, but rather that there would be a structure in which they would be justly and fairly adjudicated. Hence today, the role of the United Nations, international human rights norms and courts, international adjudication of disputes, um, they play a similar role in uh, trying to achieve that goal today. Third, the passage presumes the existence of the nation state, of separate entities working cooperatively and justly together. It did not assume, as some would argue once again today, that in order for the messianic age to come, one must do away with all distinctions and differences. It implies that what we see being affirmed today, that national distinctions are reconcilable with international peace and justice, even as individual identity is nurtured and organized through specific cultural, religious, and political constructs that include but far transcend the nation state, both supranational and subnational structures. Consider the distinctiveness of religion. It is at the same time one of the, mo uh, 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 of the most local ways 
that we organize and express our lives and identity in one of the most global. One final point, Judaism did not see these values playing out in the abstract. Before the ninth century, the common era, Jewish law had very little black letter codes that, uh, that listed all the laws. It's a case law system, either real or hypothetical. Justice was meted out by applying it to real situations, recognizing there would be competing moral values and murky moral decisions, recognizing as well the res that the, res the res responsible power um, involves uh, compromise. That was always the role of the prophet in a symbiotic relationship with the king. Anytime we have power without an encounter with those prophetic norms to call us to task, we will likely compromise our moral stature and give in to temptation to abuse power. Is that prophetic role not the role of the religious communities today, of the NGO communities in the US and globally, to be that moral goad, that prophetic voice, that voice without the power of government, which can and must remind the national and international institutions both of the goals they should pursue and of the values they must embody in that pursuit? For anyone who wonders whether or not the religious communities would really, can really make a difference, I would just remind you of the extraordinary role in the debt relief um, efforts that came out of the Jubilee year after decades of experts warning about the growing debt problem and burden of uh, nations across the um, globe. It was the galvanizing of the religious communities all across the globe on that issue that really tipped the scales um, on it, that demanded, uh, that saw the, the debt burden as enslaving um, nations and making it impossible then to get out of the condition that they had. And they demanded that Pharaoh should let those nations go. I remember sitting at a meeting of 20 congressional and religious leaders called by President Clinton in the White House cabinet room. You know, it's right next to the Oval um, Office of Cabinet Room. It's a room, if any of you remember the movie Dave, where he brings in his accountant who solves all of the, uh, the financial deficit. Um, so I'm sitting there with uh, the U2 rock star Bono on one side, himself driven by religious values, and Pat Robertson on the other side um, uh, here. And we were in agreement in this time, and we all argued with the president's support to the members of Congress that no child should be denied an education because of unending debt service to us. No family bereft of health care because our debt payments must be made. For the sake of the moral fiber of the developed nations, nations that wish to help, not harm, to aid, not assault, to develop, not destroy, we argued that we must let these nations go from the debt burdens they cannot hope to repay, burdens that creditors never intended to become so unbearable. And all these efforts helped lead to the historic 2000 agreement in Cologne when the developed nations committed $100 billion in debt relief, which has grown, these efforts have grown since. Today, however, we see the US withdrawing from leadership of the very multilateral institutions it helped develop that made the world a better place um, here. And the ripple effect of that is China and Russia fill the gap that has been left um, by American uh, withdrawal all across the globe. Um, has yet to be determined. And you know the statistics of global poverty. While we're making progress every year, over a third of the world's population, more than two billion people, live on less than $3.10 a day. More, ne more uh, uh, nearly a billion live in extreme poverty, less than $1.50 a day. A billion children live in poverty. According to UNICEF, 22,000 children die every day from causes due to poverty. Preventable diseases like diarrhea and pneumonia take the lives of two million children every year. This is something extraordinary. There's a lot we can do. The president should be commended for his determination to end HIV um, uh, transmission in the United States by 2030, but we must insist that the strategies and medicines able to reach such a goal be made available universally to the global community as well. And it always seems to be the children the children who are living in poverty, displaced from homes to refugee camps, caught in the midst of violent conflict, it is too often the children who die first. And I saw this over and over again as the US ambassador visiting some of the best and some of the worst refugee camps in the world. And that global, that global refugee crisis from Southeast Asia to South America, from Syria to Africa, um, should prick the conscience of all good people. Who amongst us will ever forget the image of three-year-old Ilam Kurdi lying dead on a Turkish speech, his five-year-old brother Galib, his mother Rehang, 
perishing nearby. We dare not stand by the blood of these children, not in the refugee camps, not on the streets of our city, not in those trafficked in brothels and sweatshops of nations across the globe, including our own nations. We must say this in voices so powerful they cannot be ignored. The Nobel Prize winning poet Nellie Sachs, a German Jewish refugee who fled Nazi persecution, wrote of the Holocaust, O night of the weeping children, O night of the children branded for death. Sleep may not enter here. Terrible nursemaids have usurped the place of mothers. Instead of mother's milk, panic suckles the little ones. Yesterday, mother still drew sleep to them like a white moon. There was a doll with cheeks derouged by kisses. In one arm, the stuffed pet, already brought to life by love, and in the other, now blow the winds of dying, blow the shifts over the hair that no one will ever comb again. In all our faith traditions, concern for the poor is central to our vision of a world of justice and peace. And let me just turn for a few moments to our own economic justice challenges that we face here in the US. Um, the model that the Jewish tradition developed, time that Jesus lived, Jesus of Nazareth lived, um, every community, every community grew to a certain size, had to have four basic institutions of social welfare. It was really the first social welfare system created in the history of the world. The food distribution program, a clothing fund, a burial fund, a communal money fund. By the Middle Ages, they had grown into a variable bureaucracy of social welfare institutions. The Tamkui, the communal kitchen for the poor, funds to rescue, resettle captives, old angel community inns in which poor travelers could say, health care programs for the poor, some universal health care programs that they share with the Catholic community. And uh, the, the Jews in Spain had a full-blown public health care system to take care of everybody. Um, and since members of the Jewish community were compelled to support these institutions, tzedakah, the Jewish term for what we call charity, but very different from, it wasn't caritas or uh, philanthropus, it wasn't love of your fellow person that was at stake. Whether you love somebody or not, you had an absolute bedrock responsibility to ensure that they would be taken care of. And these are analogous to the institutions of the state because the people could be compelled to give charity, um, in addition to which there were parallel tax systems. And of course, what all of you know, the pervasive theme of the protection of the ger, the stranger, um, the ger toshav, the resident alien, um, was entitled to all the social uh, benefits that the Jewish community was um, going to give to. How do we reconcile that with what we've seen since the Welfare Reform Act of 1996 first stripped most legal immigrants, let alone uh, non-legal immigrants, um, of, their, uh, of their federal benefits? Um, and the religious community led the successful effort to restore those then. But the tearing apart of families at the border and the failure to provide comprehensive um, uh, immigration reform that almost the entire religious community supports remains a vexing challenge um, uh, for us. Um, and the gap between the rich and the poor is the highest in the world um, today. It got so much worse between the years 2000 and 2015. We sometimes underestimate the damage done in America to the poor. It was really something quite extraordinary. Um, uh, the number of people living in poverty increased by nearly 50 by 50 percent, from 31 million to 46 million. The number of the very poor increased even more, from 12 million to 20 million. The number of children living in poverty rose from 11 and a half million to 14 million. Now, in the last few years, since 2015, things have gotten somewhat better, but we're way worse than we were in the year 2000. Um, and things, a lot of these problems are chronic problems we face um, uh, far, far uh, uh, ve more vexing um, even years before 2000. Look, every administration and Congress promises there'll be a safety net for the truly needy. But between the promise and the deed remains an aching abyss filled with the shattered lives of millions of Americans. The elderly trapped on fixed income the mother holding a child in her arms at the door of a medical specialist she cannot afford to enter because of lack of funds, the differently able facing too many barriers still at too many turns, even in our houses of worship, the lost legions of minority youth out of school, 
out of school, out of jobs, out of hope. All of these in danger of being recycled into a permanent underclass that challenges our pretensions of fairness and equal opportunity. So too the protection of God's creation and environment, perhaps the most intuitively um, uh, religious of all issues, the escalation of hate crimes um, that we have seen, um, the devastating use of guns in schools and the shootings of uh, people in houses of worship, um, the tree of life uh, killing was the most brutal, deadly anti-Semitic attack on, um, uh, in the history of America. But so long as any group can be targeted, no group is safe. We know the number of hate crimes against African Americans far surpasses even those targeting Jews, the highest religious um, uh, category. Um, make no mistake about it. We are witnessing a serious escalation of these problems and the damage by hate crimes inflict on their victims and on America requires a national response. For hate crimes are more than mere crimes of violence. They're more than murders, beatings, arsons, desecrations. Hate crimes are nothing less than attacks on the values that are pillars of our republic and the guarantors of our freedom. They are betrayal of the promise of America. They erode our national well-being. Those who commit those crimes do so fully intending to tear at the too often frayed threads of diversity that bind us together and make us strong. They seek to divide and conquer. They seek to tear us apart from within, pitting American against American, fomenting violence and civil discord. What has been so extraordinary is how the religious communities of America have stood up to stand in solidarity with Muslims who are being attacked by government policy, by others in the uh, society against the LGBTQ community, stand on behalf of those communities who are so often uh, victimized. Um, the response to the attack of this desecration in Jewish cemeteries, the attack at the uh, synagogue, um, this is something extraordinary. And I devoted my last years uh, be, uh, in, in government um, here to dealing with the issue of religious freedom um, across the globe. You know, the good news is, according to the Pew poll, 73% of the nations of the world don't have serious problems about religious freedom. The bad news is, amongst those 27% uh, that do, China, India, Pakistan, Nigeria already have um, uh, here nearly half the population of the world. Three quarters to nearly 80% of the world's population live in countries that are serious societal, meaning from the ISIS, uh, uh, the, the extremist uh, religious Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish groups, um, uh, the, the, uh, Christian, the Christian militias in the Central African Republic targeting uh, people or government policy that is repressive government and authoritarian governments are always frightened when people can organize their lives and identity around principles that the government can't control. And so they respond by trying to grab control or to deny people the right to live. Think of China and with Tibetan Buddhists and Uyghur Muslims to live freely and openly in that society. It destabilizes society. It creates large numbers of refugees, the Rohingya Muslims, um, victims of such ethnic cleansing in Myanmar um, uh, here as, uh, as examples. Um, and it is something that requires us to respond, anybody of conscience to the religiously oppressed in every land who live in fear, afraid to speak of what they believe in, who worship in underground churches, mosques, or temples, lest authorities discover and punish their devotion to an authority beyond the state, who languish in prisons, bodies broken, spirits too often disfigured, simply because they love God in their own way or question the existence of God, who feel so desperate that they flee their homes to avoid killing and persecution because of their faith for all of them. America and America's religious communities must and often do act with courage and determination to be a source of hope and light for freedom for all of them. There's a theological strand of my own tradition that represents my own beliefs that maintains that when God created the universe, God chose to leave one part of creation undone, the creation of a world of justice and peace. To complete that creation, God gave to humanity that given to nothing else of which we know, the ability to understand and choose between good and evil, the blessing and the curse, life and death. And the God entrusted to us in our sacred texts 
a common blueprint of how to build that world. In calling us to be partners with God in the completion of creation, in enabling us to be God's hands here on earth, God has ennobled humanity, raised us above mere biological existence, as the great Jewish scholar Isidore Tversky once noted, and given to our lives meaning and destiny and purpose. I know I've overwhelmed you, I'm sure, with these daunting problems. So just one note of hope on which to end. As daunting as these challenges are, we live in a time of hope of which our ancestors, our prophets, our sages throughout the ages could have only dreamed. We may indeed face perilous and unprecedented problems, but paradoxically, we may well be the first generation in all of human history that is capable of creating the kind of just, peaceful, and compassionate society of which we have all so long dreamed. For we are the first generation that actually produces enough food to feed every human being on Earth. A failure to do it now is a failure of moral vision and political will. We are the first generation that can conquer malaria and an array of diseases that have plagued humanity from time immemorial. The failure to do so is a failure of moral judge, uh, vision and political will. We are the first generation that can educate every child on Earth, lift every person out of poverty, undo the damage to our environment, and spread freedom across the globe. For all of these, our failure to do so is a failure of moral vision and political will. And of all these issues, what I've learned so clearly in my 45 years of religious and moral advocacy to government and society is a simple truth. On every issue I talked about, somebody will decide. And our only choice is whether we will be the audience watching others making those decisions or if we will help be the authors of those decisions. And this I guarantee you, if we remain silent, in the vacuum of our silence will come voices that do not share our values, our dreams, our aspirations. Dr. King said in his remarkable Riverside speech on Vietnam, we're now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. But for God's sake, the sake of our children, we must not be too late. That is one of the values that this institution, which models in its existence the kind of interfaith belief that I talked about. For when we work together, we model the kind of America we want to create. In divinity schools like this one, through the social justice work you choose to do, are the very model of that. It is one America so desperately needs. So this above all, go forward with confidence for yours is an awesome agenda. And this I know, we are not the prisoners of a bitter and unremitting past. We can be, we must be, we will be the shapers of a better and more hopeful future for all God's children. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. I have to say tonight, instead of calling you Rabbi Saperstein, I think I should say Nabi Saperstein. Uh, <laughs> So, oh, you're very I'm gracious. Uh, all right, the floor is open. I would ask you, we have a microphone, so wait till the mic gets to you. Would you please identify who you are by name and just, if you're a guest, if you're a student, if you're faculty, uh, just so... Uh, Dean, can I, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Since I uh, had the opportunity to go on for a while here, um, why don't we just let people make whatever comments and questions they have. I'll make notes, and what that means is I'll respond okay. to a few of them. What that means is you all get to speak more um, here, and I have a reason to duck the really tough questions that way. <laughs> so uh, if your game uh, here, could we uh, take a we crack at that? that? That would be great. So, so it's up to you. Let's, whoever wants to, or make a comment uh, here. So who's going to start us off? It's always that first one. 
Oh, just start calling on people then. <laughs> Come on, who's going to be the first person to start us off? Goodness. I think, I think you have persuaded them <laughs> of your basic point. I, don't, I doubt there's much disagreement. Uh, we might talk about the details. Harry. So, uh, yes, I think we all agree on a lot of what you said. Uh, but I think we'd also agree with um, some of the difficulties that you were presenting to us. <clears throat> and um, so what, what is the hope for achieving the kind of uh, religious vision that um, you've articulated for us, given the current political scene, and what do you recommend as the first steps we ought to take in uh, bringing that to, sure. to being? Anyone else want in? Yes, over here. Oh, I'm a second second year I'm a dev student and I'm also Chinese and you just talk about the religious persecution in China which we know that so much but I pretend I do not know, I pretend it does not exist and I go studying abroad and kind of leave my country maybe someday immigrate to Taiwan or oh, anyway I come from China mainland yeah and I was thinking, as a Chinese, what can I do? Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Others? Yes. Anne. Hello, my name is Anne Rothorn. I'm a neighbor and um, the wife of a former faculty person here sitting beside me. <laughs> I'd like, just like a little bit of clarification. You uh, mentioned, um, and I don't think I got your entire phrase, um, something to the effect that the protection of God's environment um, po is possibly the most critical um, issue um, confronting all religions. And I think you had a, you had a more um, a flowing and uh, uh, concise statement on that. But I'd like to hear that again. Okay. Well, yeah, over here. Thank you very much. My name is Braulio. I'm from Brazil, and uh, I'm a third year in Div. And I'm, I'm uh, concerned, for example, now with the ideologization, how do you say ideology, uh, making, ideologizing, yes, that's the word, uh, of justice. For example, I, I'll take the example of the current uh, crisis in Venezuela that is uh, not addressed properly, I, I don't think, by the media, and so like covered in some pinky, pink lights, and, and it's a major humanitarian crisis that's going on, but ideologies uh, avoid us from uh, addressing and thinking of measures that could be taken. Do you I have would... things you'd like to see done? Uh, as far as I, my experience there and uh, talking to Venezuelans, they are calling for an intervention. They don't see any other way to, to change, this, to see the situation change anytime soon. Chloe? Mm -hmm. and, and then come back up a row if you would. Thank you, Chloe Starm, faculty here. You began to offer a, a devastating critique of capitalism, but then stopped short. Given the US's utter disdain for any form of socialism, communism, even on the left, what can be done to address the justice issues that you pointed to through your critique of capitalism? Hi, I'm Basia Gardenstein, and I'm a second year MDiv student here. And you spoke about the important role of religious difference um, as well as commonality. And I was curious what your vision is for engaging with differences across religious traditions, as well as like how to engage um, the more orthodox or conservative groups within different religious traditions in this vision that you have. If, if you can handle all those in six minutes, we'll give you an award. <laughs> well, I, 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 I thought a couple more. I could duck all of the questions um, uh, here. Why don't we stop there? Uh, okay, let me, let me try. I can't do all of these. And, uh, you know, some of these I literally don't have answers to. The Venezuela thing I really anguish over. Um, you know, every time we impose sanctions, um, on a country. It really raises moral dilemmas because we always say humanitarian aid will be allowed to go, we will do it. There's hardly an example where that has really worked. And it is often the, the, the common people 
not the people who are the major targets of what we're trying to do, whose lives are devastated and crippled um, by doing this. On the other hand, if you don't do something, you allow evil to continue unconfronted um, here. And it is the Venezuelan thing it is really um, a huge uh, uh, challenge for us to, uh, uh, to do. Um, uh, military intervention raises all kinds of dilemmas that have come back to haunt um, uh, the international community um, and the United States time after time when we've done it sometimes for economic interests, when we've done it sometimes for purely humanitarian interests. I mean, I thought George Bush, uh, the first George Bush, um, I publicly defended what he did to prevent starvation from being used as a weapon of war in Somalia and the intervention that happened, that somehow we took that, uh, that extraordinarily successful humanitarian intervention and it got reduced to whether or not we could capture a warlord, Mohammed Idid, on his own territory um, in the end that led to Black Hawk Down, um, really is one of the sad stories of, of uh, uh, you know, a good attention that got uh, abuse here. I don't have an easy answer on, uh, on uh, Venezuela, um, but we have to keep trying to protect the, the, the people. Three, three million people have left already um, uh, here, and the others are just devastated uh, there. Um, the, um, the issue with China, very, very complex, you know, and what, what can be done. There's certain things that we can do. We can really keep the international pressure on China um, uh, here. We can deal with and have relations with um, uh, countries who we are critical um, of. And there's steps we can do. They're, they're cracked down on the internet um, here. We have the technologies if we would invest in doing it to actually, to actually allow, um, uh, to constrain their efforts to control what their people, um, what their people here. Um, I can come up with five or six things that are doable within that period of time, but it really requires enlightened leadership at our, you know, at the highest levels of our um, our foreign policy operators to really think those options um, through. We don't have that for the people of China. This is extraordinarily vexing. It is a deeply um, powerful authoritarian um, uh, state with a restrictive impact on uh, those are our, our thought that opening up the economy would inevitably lead to political reform um, clearly is a flawed um, set of assumptions at this uh, time and will remain flawed unless we act along the lines of what I was talking about before, to find ways to keep the pressure on to, uh, and to uh, find ways to reach the grassroots of people to help um, uh, teach them. We can't get in there to teach them skills about um, civil society organizing. There may be ways to do that from abroad um, that we haven't fully um, uh, explored yet. Obviously, those people come to the states and, or other countries and go home, go home with skills and understandings that they can help um, promulgate uh, there as well to reform um, uh, the system there. Um, the capitalism question is a fascinating question. It's one I've really wrestled with. Looking back, I, I can remember one of my great mentors when uh, I first began in the 1970s um, chastising us. We had Bob Nathan, some of the really great economists happened to be part of our policy, national policy group in the Reform Jewish Movement. And I remember being chastised by uh, Gene Lippmann um, uh, here on, you know, until you really come to grips with the inherent injustice built into the capitalist system, um, you're always going to be working around the edges. And, you know, we would point to, uh, to social welfare, capitalist systems, the Scandinavian countries and other, say that's a model of what we can do and we've done a lot of good things, but it is really terrible and, uh, you know, at some point we really have to think about it. It, it now seems so ingrained so much around the world that the question of are we better off trying to reform and get what we can to make it a more just and equitable system or to change the system remains uh, a major strategic um, uh, question that good people uh, have to wrestle with. There really is not a serious effort in the United States. It can't just come from elements of the left. It has to come from the mainstream of the country as well and have political leaders willing to challenge some of the flaws of it. And I didn't even get into things like the criminal justice system in the, in the uh, African American community or the minority communities, the school to prison pipeline, um, and what this says about America, et cetera, things I've devoted years of my life to. So uh, I'm talking about the methodology more than I am about the particular um, uh, 
uh, issues here. The question of differences amongst religious groups and how you work with people, um, I've kind of prided myself uh, making a decision in the 1990s that caused me some grief with many of my liberal friends of making common allies in working with the religious right on a whole range of issues. I really felt we could change the religious right. And uh, you know, I would say that you know, if you look at now their growing commitment away from social issues onto economic justice issues and environmental issues, they become major players in both fields. Um, uh, here I think to some extent that those efforts have, um, have uh, succeeded. And I think almost everyone in the liberal circles that I move in would acknowledge that now um, in this way. We're seeing enormous wedges within, the, you look at the younger generation of the evangelical community over gay rights issues compared to the older generation and is a huge gap. But there is in the American population in general. Um, but there's a huge gap in this issue. And I'm glad nobody asked me about the tensions between religious freedom and civil rights um, issues, because that would be a whole nother lecture um, uh, in, and of it, uh, in and of itself. Um, uh, here, so the question finally of, um, Oh, the environment, I don't have time to. I, I, you, I think you inferred correctly, I kind of skipped over um, an entire development of the theme here, but I, I, I'm, for your sake, it's a good placement of the clock behind you that uh, I saw I really didn't have time to do it, so invite me back, and uh, we'll have another opportunity to talk about that. Um, but I do want to end with uh, dealing with the first question, what is the hope um, to actually do something here? What can people do, um, et cetera? So uh, just a few quick observations about this. Um, I, I begin by saying to everyone, it doesn't matter. Choose what the passion of your heart is, and start working on that. Never let the argument that you can't do everything justify not doing anything. If everyone would pick the passion in their heart and begin to move, um, you know, common community organizing thing, let's find out where people are, group people together around um, uh, common themes and begin to have, develop strategies that can really work to make those needs um, uh, here. You know, just start where you are. Start looking for like-minded people who share those passions um, that you have. Get even more involved in politics. I do believe that politics makes a difference um, uh, here. I do think we can make tremendous structural changes in this country. And I think we're asking structural questions in America now that we haven't asked for a long, long time um, in, this, uh, in this country about race, about the economy, um, about our foreign policy. Um, and uh, you know, part of that has been the impact of this president in forcing questions on us. Some of you may like some of what he's done. Many of you, I suspect, don't. Um, but he's forced, for better or for worse, um, structural uh, questions that we um, uh, that we have to uh, resolve here. Um, so uh, you know, I, I think you can find allies sometimes. Go back to the question about working with diverse religions. Um, you can find allies in almost every area of people you work with on some things that you're going to work against them. Uh, my one criteria was I will never. You know, there are some people who are so extreme that I simply can't work with them because my doing so would legitimize them. But I cast that boundary out really far on both ends because I think you will change people by your engagement with them and working together on common grants, getting them to know you and who you are um, uh, here can help change them. So I cast that really, uh, uh, really far. Um, and uh, that means working on issues you might not otherwise work with. Fundamental rule of coalitional politics, you want to have a friend, you got to be a friend. Um, and we have to be open to the hearts and the needs and the pain and the aspirations and um, the fears of other segments of the community we don't normally deal with um, if we're really going to be effective um, in, uh, in doing this. Um, I had two great, great um, mentors. Um, in the Jewish community, in the work that I did. One, Label Fine, Leonard Fine, a uh, major um, uh, liberal ideologue in American uh, Jewish life for many, many decades. Um, and the other, some of you may have caught his obituary a week ago in the New York Times, Al Vorspan, um, who, uh, who uh, passed away. I was always fond of saying the difference between an optimist and a pessimist is that an optimist argues this is the best of all possible worlds and a pessimist agrees. Um, here. Well, we are often the eternal optimists here. Um, uh, here. We really believe we can 
take the world as we find it, put it on the anvil of life, and beat it into the kind of shape that our tradition has said is the rightful inheritance of every one of God's children. Um, and for the reasons I'm saying, this is the time um, to get involved. So um, do it with confidence, uh, with determination, um, in accordance with what you believe in and the limitations of other demands on your life. But start somewhere and make the commitment this year. Let us all do a bit more this year than we did last year and keep going in that direction for all the years to come until we fulfill these goals. Thank you very much. <laughs>